Welcome to Apostolic Archive. We have gathered many wonderful sermons through the years and we have decided to share them with the world. We hope you enjoy. Please subscribe to our channel. Please like the video and comment with something you take away from this message. Also, hit the bell below so you can receive an update as soon as we upload new content. Blessings. I am going to preach this morning. My subject matter and is baptized shall be saved. So I'm not apologizing for what I'm about to preach. For what I'm about to preach is foundational to our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. However, I do desire that you understand my intention. The words that I speak to you today are not meant to be condemning, but they're meant to be liberating. They, the statements that I emphatically make are not designed to be accusatory, but revelatory or to give understanding and it's my hope and it has been my prayer because I have been praying for this for more than a week that those of you who know that you have been obedient to the scripture can greatly rejoice this morning at what baptism has afforded you and those that may be on your way to a deeper relationship with Christ you can look forward to baptism with full understanding of the freedom that it brings and be motivated to be baptized ASAP and it's really cold right now but by the end of service it's going to be warm and those of you who are not sure that you were baptized properly will with courage take the step of faith to fulfill the commandment of the of God and be rebaptized in Jesus name so I'm gonna preach to you I'm gonna read a lot of scriptures they're gonna be rapid fire they're gonna be emphatic and I'm going to read the Word of God emphatically. And most of what I'm going to be giving to you is purely the Word of God. I'm going to have some connected words with it. So you know I'm not going to apologize, but I do tell you my intentions. It's kind of not nice to know that you have dessert at the end of the meal, right? So we know exactly where we're going. And I'm reading from Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse number 19. This is the writing of the Apostle Paul. And he says, so remember when we're reading of the Apostle Paul's writing, he has memorized most of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. He's a Pharisee of the Pharisees. That means that he knows all of the law, both uh, God's law and the law of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He has a full picture of what the Old Testament or Old Covenant was, and the Old Covenant was designed to lead us to Christ. In fact, Paul said the law was the schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. And once we're with Christ, it's not about the law. It's not about the schoolmaster anymore. It's about Christ. And he says, now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So you and I are the building, the body of Christ. He's speaking to the born-again believers, a dwelling place for the Spirit. Thank you for standing in honor to the Word of God, and you may be seated. My title, And is Baptized, Shall Be Saved. The subtitle would be, The Power of Burial Over Death. In Mark 16 and 16, Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved but he who does not believe will be condemned the first and the last words of Jesus are critically important the words of the first sermon of Jesus uh, to his disciples were the building blocks for everything else that Jesus would teach they have impacted many generations of believers the sermons that were preached uh, by out of these scriptures are innumerable it's what we call the Sermon on the Mount or the Beatitudes which are foundation stones of healthy human relationships and also a healthy relationship with God. 
And there is no doubt among Christendom of the importance of these first words of Jesus. It doesn't matter what church you go to almost, you're going to hear teaching on the Beatitudes. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the meek. All of these Beatitudes. And we emphatically state them and say these are important because these are the words of Christ. Now, we return now to the words recorded by Mark that are encapsulated in the final statements of a command that Jesus gives to his disciples while standing on a mountain knowing that they would not see him in the flesh again. Mark 16, 16, and I'm going to read it several times. He who believes and is baptized shall will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. The disciples of Christ had been through the most traumatic event associated with their relationship with Jesus. The first words of this chapter set the emotional stage. It's about them going to the tomb and finding it empty. And the center of the chapter gives a snapshot view of the preceding 40 days to this statement. Here's the timeline. Jesus has been dead for three days, and the disciples are locked themselves in a room in Jerusalem. Most theologians believed it was the same upper room that they had taken the Last Supper, and it would be the same upper room to which God would return in the power of the Holy Ghost. Three of the women decided to go to the cemetery and anoint the body of Jesus. So they were let out of the house. And when they got there, Jesus was not there, but there were grave clothes. And a young man, John's gospel declares him to be an angel, is sitting at the tomb. And this angel declares, he is not here, for he is risen. The women are commanded to return to the disciples and declare that Jesus would meet them in Galilee. We are then told of several ways in which Jesus appears to mankind over the next 40 days. He appears on the road to Emmaus to his disciples that are walking along and they're kind of kicking dirt and they're disappointed because of the crucifixion of Jesus. He also appears to the 11 while they're at dinner and later he appears to them in Galilee. And Jesus is now speaking to the highly committed that have great resumes. I want you to listen to just snapshots of the resumes of these disciples. Peter stated, we have left all to follow you. Matthew left his receipt of custom, a good government job, to follow Jesus. Zacchaeus sold everything to follow Jesus. Uh, James and John walked out of the family business. And after the crucifixion of Jesus, these disciples had hidden under threat of their lives. At least one of the women that came to the tomb had nowhere else to go for refuge. She was homeless. The zealots among the disciples, and there were three, had abandoned their pursuit of government overthrow. And many of the disciples' families had lived with less because the leader of the family had been following this itinerant preacher and neglecting their occupations. And Jesus had said, I don't even know where I'm going to sleep tonight. How did they face their families and tell them they had been duped? What were their conversations like after Calvary and Jesus is lying in the tomb? These men and women were committed followers, disciples. They'd been threatened, intimidated, rejected, ridiculed, impoverished. And you can go on with a whole bunch more adjectives. Remember, Jesus had made all kinds of promises to them and allowed himself to be killed. He did not even defend himself at trial. He didn't pull himself off of the cross. He didn't do some miracle to deliver himself from that death. Surely such sacrifice and show of devotion would win these disciples entrance into the kingdom of God. I hear people say, all you have to do is confess him and he is your Lord and you're saved and you can never be lost. Well, look at these disciples. They'd done much more than confess Christ. They'd done much more than say, I I believe in you. 
They had followed him. These disciples had believed what Jesus had taught. They had embraced the lifestyle that Jesus had lived. They had preached in Jesus' name, cast out devils in Jesus' name. They had laid hands on the sick in Jesus' name. They had declared Jesus to be the Messiah. They had sacrificed on every level of their life. What I'm trying to get us to see is we don't determine what brings salvation. He determines what brings salvation. It's not our degree of devotion, but it's our obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can tell the boss all the things you do right, but if you don't do the right things, sorry, you don't get a paycheck. You can tell them how much you love the brand, how much you love him, how much devoted you are. But if you don't show up to work and do your job, you probably won't get a paycheck and probably you'll be locked out. The next words that Jesus would speak would surely be words of commendation. Perhaps he would grant them immediate entrance into his kingdom after all they had done. They had forsaken all and then they had been ridiculed and now he's alive and they follow him for 40 more days. Some had no jobs. Others had put their family relationships in jeopardy. Many had no permanent home because they had been following Jesus. Some had been ostracized by society. All had given of their finance. All had laid aside their personal dreams to buy into the message of Jesus. But all of this would not bring salvation. Jesus was the only way to salvation. So these men and women had paid a great price to follow Jesus. Their emotions had ridden a roller coaster of fear, amazement, uncertainty, hope, disappointment, excitement, failure, fulfillment, just like our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we don't always get what we want when we want it. And sometimes we get disappointed and maybe even a little miffed at God or angry at God because it didn't happen when we thought it should happen or in the way in which we thought it would happen. But the sacrifices that they made and the struggles they endured and the rejection they had suffered, the threats they had lived under, the the public declaration of their loyalty to Jesus' name were not enough to qualify them for salvation. These courageous people are standing in the mountain very near Jerusalem. Now remember, we had said Jesus preached his first sermon there. Now he is preaching his last sermon. And they're anxious to hear more from this one who revealed secrets that had been hidden since the foundation of the world. For the Bible says for 40 days he had been declaring those secrets to them that had been hidden. And this last declaration of Jesus is very clear. They don't realize it's going to be his last declaration. They're just listening. They're following. The expectation of Christ was very explicit. God does not speak in riddles. Now we do know that there were riddles that were spoken to those that were distant followers. And then Jesus would give understanding to his disciples. He always gives clear understanding to those that are highly committed to them. People in this world will go, what? You mean you're baptized and it washes away your sins? How does that, that's crazy. How does that work? But you and I understand because we have come close and we have obeyed him. Obedience would bring great reward, but failure to obey would have eternal consequences. You see, this relationship with Jesus Christ, it's not on again, off again. It's either all or nothing. And if we give him all, then there is an eternal reward. If we reject him, there is eternal damnation is what the Bible says. You see, God is a God of balance and justice. How can we say, hey, there's eternal reward, but there is no eternal damnation? That just doesn't make sense. That's like saying, hey, if you come to work, you get paid, and you still get paid if you don't come to work. I mean, that just doesn't work, at least not if you're the boss. But God never intended for it to be that way. The Bible says if if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. You see, God has a balance in all of life, and that's his laws that he put over this creation and what he designed for humanity to live with. 
We must remember the mission of Jesus, which he declared in Luke 19 and verse number 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He had a purpose. He had a defined mission. He didn't come to uh, eliminate slavery. Now that's shocking, isn't it? He didn't come to push the evil Roman government out of its place. He didn't come to make sure everybody had enough food. Now, he did feed those that followed him, but then when he said, I don't even know what I'm going to eat tomorrow, they weren't going to follow him anymore. See, Jesus didn't come as a social justice warrior. Church, we are not social justice warriors. We are ambassadors of Christ. We are meant to give. The, we have the ministry of reconciliation, reconciling man unto God. You can't fix all the problems of the world. But Jesus can fix one life at a time. And only he can save. And only he can deliver. And only he can heal. And only he can forgive. And only he can restore the mind. You and I can't do that. You see, he doesn't want us to live forever on this earth in its defiled state. That's not his intention at all. The only time that there's going to be perfect justice on this earth as it exists is when he rules with a rod of iron in the millennial reign. And he says, okay, move aside and I'm in charge now. That's the only time there's going to be any semblance of peace. But that is only going to last for a thousand years. There has to be a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness for there to be lasting peace. Because this has been corrupted. So the last words Jesus, of Jesus contain words of warning and instruction that would remind the disciples of what would be required to obtain salvation. Again, I read Mark 16 and 16. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. So all you have to do is not believe or neglect faith in Christ and you're condemned. But if you have faith in Christ, you've got to do more than just have faith in Christ. You must be baptized to be saved. So these are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if irrefutably we preach out of the Beatitudes again and again and again because it's warm and fuzzy and feels good, then we've got to preach out of the last words of Christ too uh, because uh, unless we have that demarcation line between saved and lost, between salvation and condemnation, uh, there's just a fuzzy line there. I am so glad God gave me clear instruction of what I could do to be saved. I'm not living in wondering. I'm not living in confusion. I'm not living in hoping against hope. But I know. You see, giving large sums of money did not bring any promise of life everlasting. Leaving a career was not enough to guarantee salvation. Forsaking family did not qualify a person to inherit eternal life and public declaration fall, fell far short of the requirement of salvation. Emotional stress didn't bring any promise of everlasting life. Rejection by society was the price they had to pay to follow Jesus, but it wasn't a high enough price to bring salvation. Preaching or doing miracles in the name of Jesus did not ensure the kingdom. Sacrifice would not bring salvation. In fact, Jesus, uh, it says, in the end, he's going to say to those who say, hey, we cast out devils in your name. We spoke with tongues. Uh, and he says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. There are people that are going to do a lot of good things in the name of Jesus uh, that are not intimate with him. And we're going to talk about what breaks down the barrier between our intimacy with God. There was only one road or way to salvation. I want us to see Jesus went to Gethsemane and died to his desires. Then he went to Calvary and died to a future ruled by the flesh. He was then buried in another man's tomb, a borrowed tomb, and he was raised from the dead by the power of the Spirit. 
We have got to walk the path that Jesus walked in order to have eternal salvation. In order to say like he was able to say, death had no more dominion over him. Why? Because it's appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. You see, the mission of Jesus to seek and to save the lost and to give his life a ransom from mankind would fulfill the gospel, which was the death, the burial, and the resurrection as spoken of by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. Jesus' death was not enough. A temporary grave was needed, a place to lay down the corruptible flesh. And Jesus could have sinned, but he didn't sin. If he couldn't have sinned, then he could not have fulfilled the, 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 the commandment. He had to live above sin in order to be a sinless sacrifice. He had to make that choice. A tomb from which to rise in newness of life was without doubt a mandatory place or part of bringing to pass the fulfillment of the gospel and the opening of the way to salvation to all mankind. How could Christ's followers do anything less than that which he did? Again, the final sermon to his disciples said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. It's easy to be condemned. Just do nothing. Don't respond to him. Don't in faith respond to the word of God. But oh, to be saved, it takes some work. We've got to do more than just say, I believe. If I believe, I'm going to do something about it. I don't know, Brother Martin, I suppose they could come into the paint store and you could give them the base color of paint. You say, I want it brown. And they say, okay, let me put some tint in it. No, I'll just take it as is and I'll just paint it on my house and believe it'll be brown. It's never going to be brown until you put the right tint in the paint. It's never going to be what we expect it to be. You've got to follow some laws of physics, some rules in order to get uh, the results. You can drive and drive, and, and believe me, i figured it out on every vehicle that I've owned. And once that red light goes on and says ding, ding, and it says E, eventually it will run out of fuel. Yes, and then you've got to wait for AAA to get there or, you know, take the gallon of gas out of the trunk or whatever it is, and you've got to fill it up with fuel because you can defy that empty sign all you want, and it's going to go empty even if you say it's not going to go. So if the natural laws of this world, it's just like we can say, oh, I love you, but I'm not going to pay any attention to you. I'm not going to talk to you. I'm not going to spend any time with you. I'm not going to provide for you. If I did that to my wife, she wouldn't be my wife. That's just the basics of it. Why? Because if you love somebody, the Bible says love suffereth long and is kind, and it tells all the things that love does in 1 Corinthians 13, and even gives laws for the rules of marriage in the, in the writings of the Apostle Paul, and God, Christ even gave some of those rules. There's laws to follow. So why should we be shocked or surprised that it takes more than just confessing the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved? It's one thing to acknowledge. It's another thing to respond or to obey or to act upon our acknowledgement that He is Lord. If He is Lord, that means He's in charge. He calls the shots. He can do whatever He is, wants to do. But oh, to have His Lordship in my life is a great reward. I'm talking to you about God's view of baptism. I'm speaking to you from the never dying word of God. I mentioned at the beginning of my statement, I make no apologies for being this emphatic. Because this is about our eternity. This is about our forever. This is about where we're going to spend our everlasting existence. This is not a speech about, of conjecture. It's not a multiple choice option. 
It's not some esoteric statement filled with ambiguity. Jesus is not asking for his disciples' opinion. Jesus is not making a suggestion. Jesus is not saying, what do you guys think? He's saying, this is the way it is. Now, who am I to argue with God? Who am I to tell the Creator, you shouldn't have done it that way? We mentioned recently in the, in the prophets, uh, one place, uh, the Lord is speaking to the prophet. And he says, you ask the people, where were you when the stars of the morning sung? Where were you at creation? Where you were you when I spoke everything into existence? You weren't even there, so don't tell me what it was like. You and I are eyewitnesses. Only the angelic host uh, and God were eyewitnesses. Uh, and oh, look what happened to those uh, who rejected uh, God uh, in the heavenlies. Uh, they've lost their first estate and they have no chance of redemption. Thank God for redemption. This is an emphatic statement of fact. This is an absolute spiritual truth. This is a statement of unchanging truth. The scripture is a revelation of eternal spiritual truth. Jesus also said, and I don't have this in your list, in Matthew 24 and 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will be by no means pass away. Yeah. So you can shake all of this up. It can burn, uh, people can rebel, uh, it can flood, uh, there can be changes of seasons, uh, men can defy me, but my word is not going to pass away. Why? Because it's forever settled in heaven. It's in a place where man can't mess with it. The same apostle that preached the salvation sermon on the day of Pentecost later wrote by inspiration of the Holy Ghost in 1 Peter 3 and 18. For Christ also suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient when once the law divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an anti-type which now saves us baptism not the removal of the filth of the flesh but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ he's saying oh just like the ark saved Noah and his family baptism saves us uh, somebody asked me years ago they said do you really think baptism saves us I said do you think Noah would have got through the flood without the ark he could try all he wanted, but we know there were only eight that were saved. Why? Because they came through the water in the ark. Just like Jesus died and was buried and rose again, we can die and be buried and rise again in newness of life. Let me read verse 21 again in the New Living Translation, 1 Peter 3, 21. And this is the picture of baptism which now saves us by the power of Jesus Christ's resurrection. Baptism is not the removal of dirt from your body. It is the appeal to God from a clean conscience. In other words, we've already repented. That's where the clean conscience comes from. Jesus did great works before Calvary, and he undoubtedly did greater things after Calvary by his resurrection from the dead. But you and I can follow the example of Christ by participating in Gethsemane and trusting God's plan and surrendering to the will of God when he said, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He sweat great drops of blood. It was anguish. You, it, it's, it's hard to repent. I'm not saying you have to cry, but you may cry. 
It's saying, uh uh uh, and it's not about what I want, it's what you want, God. And there's something liberating about that, surrendering to the will and to the purpose of God. So if you have followed this plan, you have cause to rejoice. If you're uncertain, then you've got to make sure you've done it the way God expects it done. You can participate in Calvary, dying out to your old life through repentance, and you can participate in resurrection uh, through the newness of life. If a man or a woman has died out to sin through repentance, he or she must have a pathway to new life. If you've been baptized into Jesus Christ, you have died with Jesus Christ, your old sinful nature is destroyed, your sins have been remitted or paid for, the body of sin has been destroyed, and you also rise with Jesus Christ, free from sin, free from death, and free from condemnation. Baptism is not a work of the flesh. Baptism is obedience in the flesh for a work of the Spirit. We've got to understand, it's not just an outward sign of an inward work. Something really happens when we're baptized into Christ Jesus. Something in the spirit world changes. There's a shift in authority. Romans 6 and 1 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who have died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. That's not my words. That's the never dying word of God. If you have been baptized into Christ Jesus, into the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you rise in newness of life. That's a God thing. That's a God promise. That's a promise of the one who said, let there be light and there was light. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more more death no longer has dominion over him no authority to touch him when Jesus rose from the dead he could never die again it is appointed unto man once to die when the man Christ Jesus died and rose again that's it can't touch him again Death has no more dominion. That's why if we die with him and are buried with him, when we rise again, eternal death has no dominion over you and me. It cannot touch us, not because of what we said, but because of what he said, not because of what we did, but because of what he did on Calvary for death. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives unto God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. One of the glories of baptism is the hiding place we now have in Christ Jesus. That hiding place is mentioned in the book of Colossians chapter 3. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Baptism into the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is critically important because if we're hidden with Him, then we rise with Him in glory. That's heaven. Baptism frees a soul from eternal damnation, the penalty of sin, which is the, de- the, the second death. Baptism saves us. Baptism is important. Baptism is the only way into the promise of being the heir with Christ and inheriting eternal life. Galatians 3 and 20 
6 reads this way. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise of what? A city whose builder and maker is God. Oh, I am so grateful that I have been baptized into Christ Jesus and hidden with him. Baptism makes us heirs with Christ of all things. The name of Jesus is an essential part of baptism. This is the critical part of my message. In Acts chapter number 10 and verse number 1, it says, And it happened, while, or 19 and 1, It happened while Apollos was at Corinth, that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples. So we read part of the book of Ephesus just a few minutes ago. Uh, but now this is the beginning of the church at Ephesus. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit? when you believed and they said to him we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Spirit and he said to them into what then were you baptized and they said to John's baptism and Paul said John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance so they had been baptized but it was the baptism of repentance I've repented so I'm being baptized saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid hands on them, they, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about twelve in all. You see the power of the name of Jesus? He says, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? The what? Well, here's the solution. Let me baptize you into name, the name of Jesus. No wonder Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. He knew that there was a promise of the Holy Ghost but they hadn't received it so obviously there was something wrong with the formula or the process through which they had passed. In Acts chapter number 4 and verse 10, he says, Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men with, by which we must be saved. The only way is Jesus. He said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No wonder we baptize into the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. The name is important. There's a funny thing that happened in my family, kind of. Well, my stepmom, she's lived by herself for years after my dad passed away. And it just came to the point where she had to go to a care home. And, of course, with COVID, nobody could go to St. Louis to help her. And all of us kids are trying to work out the deals. And so one of my brothers texts and says, uh, uh, we need $10,000 a piece from each one of you to help mom out. And so I... I my brother, is, he goes by Bishop John Hansen. And so I wrote out a check to Bishop Hansen, $10,000. And I wrote it all out. And I signed it, your brother. And I took a picture of it, and I sent it to him. Now, I know there's kind of a risk. You know, you take a picture of the, you got to take a picture of the front and the back of the check in order to deposit it, right? In your digital thing. But the crazy thing about it was is that I just wrote it to the bishop from his brother. I knew it was a check that would never work. And my, my siblings all got the joke. It was, yeah, yeah, that's funny. So I sent a picture and they knew that I was giving him a bogus form of payment. 
Of course, he really was being a, a little tongue-in-cheek and asking for the $10,000 apiece, and I was acting like I was all philanthropic and, you know, the first one to the table with my money. It, didn't, it doesn't work. But if I would have written to John Hansen, and I would have signed it Steve Hansen, he would have been authorized to take that check to the bank and at least try to cash it. And then we would have been playing basketball the rest of our life trying to, you know. Why? Because the money wasn't there in the account. But that's the way it is when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got to be baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? We, we don't just say, oh, I'm going to be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Well, tell me what that name is. Jesus said, I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. Another will come in his own name, and you will receive him. He later said, and the Holy Ghost, which the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things whatsoever you have done. They all knew what the name of Jesus was. No wonder when they began baptizing people as the early New Testament church, you can look all throughout the scriptures through the book of Acts, and you can find confirmation in all the epistles. They didn't just use titles. They used the name of the Lord Jesus Christ or used the name of Jesus Christ. You see, there is only one name, there's only one way and there's only one baptism Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus later in chapter 4 and verse 4 there is one body and one spirit just as you are called in one hope of your calling one Lord, one faith one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all am I going to apologize? No, this is the book Paul spent three and a half years in the wilderness being instructed of God. And nobody, none of the other apostles contended with him and said, whoa, 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 shut up. No, they agreed with it and they preached it. In fact, twice Paul had to go to Jerusalem and speak to those that were in charge. And they had to question him. Are you really preaching what we're preaching? And both times they sent him on his way and said, okay, you're preaching what we are preaching. It is essential to be baptized if we are to be saved. And it is clear that we must be baptized into Christ. The scripture is emphatic that there is only one baptism. And the precedence for rebaptism is certain. We read it in Acts 19. And the mandate was given by Jesus Christ. The only mode of baptism validated by the apostles was into the name of Jesus. Christ. I go back to one of our starting scriptures, Mark 16 and 16. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. If you stand with me, please, I just have a few short remarks. And then we are going to give you a chance to rejoice in the Lord if you have been baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. If you have not been baptized into the name of Jesus Christ and you are pursuing a relationship with Jesus Christ, you're welcome to be baptized this morning. And I see the water still cold because the heater didn't come on. Or you can wait till after the 1115 service. <laughs> or as... Brother Alan Peake said, the colder it is, the more you stick. It was freezing cold in January when I got baptized, and it was up to my neck. I was thankful I was in the tank because they used to break the ice in the river where I lived and baptize people. And yeah, they survived. Have you obeyed that you might be saved? And I pray, look closely at what you have done and what others have said when you were baptized. Because the authority is in the name of Jesus. It's not in your brother. No. It's not in father. It's not in son. It's not in, those are, those are ways in which God appeared unto man. 
He was the Father in creation, the Son in redemption, and the Holy Spirit in regeneration. But we know him by the name of Jesus. We pray in his name. We cast out devils in his name. We speak with tongues in his name. We do it all in the name of Jesus. Why? Because that's where the authority is. And how do we get that authority? By being buried with him. That just as Christ died and was buried, and he rose again, even we, so we also should walk in newness of life. If you're not certain how you've been baptized, go find your certificate. Call up the person who baptized you and say, what did you say? Because the name of Jesus is the only name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Have you been buried with Christ? Have you risen in newness of life? Has sin and death lost their hold on you? We can baptize you today. We can rebaptize you today. But if you have already been baptized into his name, today is a day to rejoice because sin has no more dominion, no more authority in your life. So this altar is going to be opened in about 30 seconds for you to come and, sh and rejoice. It's going to be open for you to search your heart. Uh, and if you want to be baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can come see me or you can go talk to one of these uh, men that have a red badge on one of the ushers uh, and they'll make preparations for you to be baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. I apologize that it's cold, but it's all right. It's about salvation. It's about being ready when Jesus comes again. I want to be ready. I've got to be ready. I'm going to be ready. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Let's rejoice at what baptism has done for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your greatness. Thank you for your love. Thank you, God, for washing away my sin, for purifying me with the